Hello, my friends. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews. Today, I'm going to be doing increased intracranial pressure and Cushing's triad, which, a, which is an indication of increased intracranial pressure and has nothing to do with Cushing's disease, okay? So Cushing's triad and Cushing's disease are not the same thing. So let's go ahead and get started. Hello, Clinic Review family. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews, the home of the very best NCLEX review in the entire universe, in my opinion. Mark Klimek is the goat of NCLEX review. You can still get his NCLEX review online on demand. It's a 21 plus hour uh, recorded NCLEX review. It's very, very good. No one does it better, in my opinion, than he does. He's been the goat of NCLEX review for a very long time. He's getting older. He's getting close to retirement, but you can still see him live in person if you want to. Just go to clinicreviews.com and sign up for one of his live in-person three-day NCLEX reviews in Ohio. Uh, we also do small group tutoring for four sessions in a month. It's a monthly package, and you can also do our streaming service. All right, let's go ahead and talk about increased intracranial pressure. This is something, can I be honest with you, I don't know that much about. I'm not a neuro nurse, so I'm going to be teaching you what you need to know for the NCLEX. And the blue book right here behind me, published by Mark Klimek himself, I'm pointing to it over my shoulder. You can go to Amazon and you can um, look for Klimek Blue Book, and it's the only thing that'll pop up. It has a bunch of facts, facts in it. ICP, increased intracranial pressure is in there. And so the information that you need to know to answer these questions is in the blue book, but I don't do the teaching. I just ask the questions and I'm going to do a little teaching as we go along, but um, I don't do like a big lecture ahead of time. So let's go ahead and get started. And I will do some teaching as we go along, which pathophysiologic processes can cause increased ICP select all that apply cerebral vasodilation from hypercapnia, decreased blood osmolarity, hyperventilate, hyperventilate <laughs> leading to hypocapnia, cytotoxic cerebral edema after ischemia or hypothermia below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so this is just either you know it or you don't. So it's hypercapnia that causes increased ICP and cerebral vasodilation can cause that. So anytime someone is prone to vasodil cerebral vasodilation or hypercapnia, that's what we're watching for, which is why one of the ways we treat increased ICP is hyperventilation. So they blow off more CO2, they vasoconstrict, and it actually lowers ICP. Uh, decreased blood osmolarity. Decreased blood or serum osmolarity means dilution, more uh, fluid, less solute. Okay. So it's hemodilution and hemodilution does cause fluid to shift into the brain cells. So hemodilution or decreased blood osmolarity uh, does cause fluid to shift into the brain cells and can increase ICP. Hyperventilation leading to hypocapnia, that's the opposite of what does it. In fact, hyperventilation and hypocapnia is one of the treatments for increased ICP. Cytotoxic cerebral edema after ischemia. You know what? Even if you don't know any of those words mean, you should know cerebral edema is increased ICP. So there you go. It's something that's there at risk for after stroke. The ischemia is the stroke, right? So it can lead to cerebral edema hypothermia below 95 degrees. No, hypothermia is not a risk. So A, B, and D are the risk factors for increased ICP. So if you think about this, uh, stroke is a risk factor, closed head injury is a risk factor, meningitis is a risk factor. Um, those kind of things are all risk factors for I increased ICP. The nurse receives the following shift report, which client should be assessed immediately for possible increased ICP. Stroke client whose NIHSS improved from 12 to 8. So NIHSS, National Institutes of Health Stroke Scale, I think, is what NIHSS stands for. So even if you don't know what the scoring on there, it tells you it's improved. So if somebody's stroke scale is improving, I'm not going to say 
they have increased ICP. I would expect it to get worse if they have increased ICP. I'm sorry, I should read all the answers before I start answering it. Post craniotomy patient or client with urine output of 50 mils per hour, brain tumor client whose blood pressure rose from 128 over 78 to 154 over 88, and their heart rate fell from 82 to 64, meningitis client with a temperature of 101 despite acetaminophen. All right, so who's at who's at risk for increased ICP? I would say A had a stroke, so they're at increased ri risk, but their stroke scale improved, so I'm going to cross them off the list. A cr post craniotomy client is at increased risk, but their urine output is okay, so they're not holding on to fluid, so I'm going to cross them off the list. Brain tumor client, they're at increased risk, and they have evidence of Cushing's triad. Cushing's triad are three symptoms that show you probably have uh, increased ICP. So it's a widening pulse pressure, which means the systolic gets higher. The diastolic doesn't raise as much. So the difference between 128 and 78 is like, um, what is that? 50 points, maybe 50 points. The difference between 154 and 88 is 70 points approximately. Not, not quite, but we have a bigger difference between the systolic and diastolic. That's called a widening pulse pressure. So widening pulse pressure is one of Cushing's triad. Bradycardia is one of Cushing's triad. And then the other one is change in respiratory rate. And usually Shane Stokes respirations is what you look for. Okay. So increased, uh, it's Shane Stokes is rapid, shallow respirations. So those are the three components of, Shane, of uh, Cushing's triad. So we have two of those, and plus they have a brain tumor. So I'm very concerned about C. Meningitis, that's an increased risk with a temperature of 101 despite acetaminophen. Well, I'd expect their temperature to be up. They have, they have an infection. Meningitis is an infection. The acetaminophen didn't bring it down, but that's not as many risk factors as C, has way more risk factors uh, and evidence of Cushing's triad. So we're going to go ahead and pick C. During bedside shift report, which finding in a client with traumatic, traumatic brain injury indicates worsening, increased ICP, and should be reported to the provider immediately. Bilateral sluggish pupils, mild headache relieved by acetaminophen, urine output 150 mils in four hours. Glasgow coma scales change from 13 to 10. All right, worsening so that we already know they have increase, we already have, they have increased ICP, it tells us. It indicates worsening increased ICP. So we know they have increased ICP. So bilateral sluggish pupils is expected with ICP. So that's expected. I don't know if it's worse because it doesn't tell us what it was before. So it's hard for me to know. A is a symptom of ICP, but it could have been their baseline since they already had it. Mild headache relieved by acetaminophen is not uh, does not indicate worsening ICP. Adequate urine output does not indicate worsening ICP. A worsening Glasgow coma scale does indicate. So the difference between A and D is that D tells us it's getting worse. A, I don't know if it's getting worse or not. So I'm going to pick the D that tells me it's specifically getting worse. I've said this before on other videos. Pick the answer you know is right, not the answer you're unsure of. I know D indicates worsening ICP. I'm not sure about A, so I'm going to pick the answer that I know indicates worsening ICP. A client with increased ICP is receiving mannitol, which is an osmotic diuretic, 25 grams IV. Which parameter is most important for the nurse to monitor to evaluate therapeutic effect? Serum sodium, serum osmolality, urine output, mean arterial pressure. So mannitol, I said, is an osmotic diuretic, and the whole purpose is to pull fluid out of the brain cells and get rid of it, right? So we're trying to decrease overall pressure. So how do we know we're getting rid of fluid? Out of all of these options, the only way I know I'm getting rid of fluid is urine output. So don't make this harder than it has to be. Don't go, well, it could be something else. Okay, but you know that one way we know a diuretic is working is when urine output increases. And MAP has nothing to do with it. Uh, serum sodium has nothing to do with it. And you might go, well, maybe serum osmolality, maybe, but we know urine output is what tells us we're actually getting rid of fluid. So I'm picking that one. The provider orders hyperventilation. I told you that's a treatment for increased ICP to keep the PACO2 30 to 35 millimeters of mercury in a patient client with refractory ICP. Refractory means it's tough to treat. 
What is the physiologic rationale? So PaCO2 is an ABG CO2, uh, arterial blood gas. And we normally, we keep PaCO2 35 to 45. So he's saying keep them a little low. Constricts cerebral blood vessels, decreases cerebral metabolic rate, promotes CSF absorption or enhances venous return. So we talked about it in the first question, if you remember. Hypercapnia leads to vasodilation, which is a risk for ICP. So if we do hypocapnia, it causes vasoconstriction, which decreases ICP. Now, one of the ways we treat elevated ICP is to decrease cerebral metabolic rate. We can do that with medications that um, basically sedate the patient. So we can use that, like in the ICU, they may use propofol, for example, which is a sedating medication, decreases cerebral metabolic rate, um, but it's uh, inducing hypocapnia is a common treatment for treating ICP. A client with a brain tumor develops Cushing's triad. Cushing's triad is Shane Stokes respirations, widening pulse pressure, and bradycardia, which indicates increasing ICP. Which nursing action should be performed first? Notify the neurosurgeon, increase oxygen to 100% via non-rebreather, administer IV labetalol per sliding scale, prepare for rapid sequence intubation. All right. I don't know that we're going to have to intubate them yet. I would want to notify the surgeon before we determine they're going to have to be intubated. So A certainly comes before D, so I'm crossing off D. Um, I don't know about the labetalol. I don't know what the blood pressure is specifically. And I don't know that that's what I would do first anyway. So I'm going to cross off C. So the question is, because hyperventilation, increasing oxygenation, is one of the treatments for ICP. It lowers CO2 and it hyperventilates, which helps. So um, do I want to notify them and then hyperventilate them or give them more oxygen or do I want to hyperventilate them and then notify? Um, I want to hyperventilate them and then notify. And this is sort of a rule. Well, I would just say sort of. It is a rule on the NCLEX that if there's something you can do before you call the doctor, you should do it. Now, that's only if you know that the thing to do is correct. Like, I don't know that C and D are correct, so I'm not going to do those before I call the doctor. But I do know that Cushing's triad indicates increased ICP, and I do know that hyperventilation is one of the treatments I can do for that. I don't know that C and D are treatments for that at this point, but I know B is. So if there's something you can do that is appropriate before notifying the physician, that's what you should do. That's an NCLEX testing rule. Which client positioning minimizes ICP most effectively? Supine with head midline, head of bed 30 degrees. High fowlers at 90 degrees with knees flexed. Prone to head with head turned to the side. Sideline with neck flexed toward the chest. So um, the uh, blue book tells you you should keep it between 10 and 30 degrees. Uh, what you don't want to do is do completely supine. Uh, well, certainly prone is bad. They're laying on their on their flat on their stomach with their head turned. That decreases venous outflow from the head. We don't want to do that. Side lying with neck flexed toward the chest also decreases venous outflow. So we don't want to do that. You might say, well, but the high fowler's at 90 degrees. So what you want to do is you have to find a balance between um, not um, getting too much blood to the head, but, but still allowing venous outflow. So between 10 and 30 degrees is your best uh, bet for, and, and then keeping it in a neutral position and knees flexed can decrease venous outflow. So you want to make sure you have maintained venous outflow, which is why we're not sitting up too high because it, it bends the femoral veins and all those vessels in the, in the trunk and the legs, and it decreases venous outflow. So, but you don't want the head completely flat because you don't want to increase the swelling, right? So that's why A is the correct answer. The nurse is caring for a mechanically ventilated client with elevated ICP who suddenly coughs vigorously during suctioning, which is bad. You don't want coughing because that increases ICP. Which ventilator adjustment will best prevent further spikes in ICP during future suctioning? Increase PEEP from 5 to 10, switch to pressure support ventilation, decrease tidal volume to reduce intrathoracic pressure, increase FiO2 to 100% one minute before suctioning. So why do they cough when you are suctioning them? You might say, well, it hits their gag reflex. Well, if they're ventilated, it really doesn't hit their gag reflex. 
So why does it happen? Do you know why it happens? It happens because they become hypoxic during vent, very, during um, suctioning. And so what we can do to decrease that coughing is actually to hyperventilate them uh, uh, one minute with 100% oxygen for one minute, not for one minute, one minute before you start the suctioning. PEEP is bad. That increases interthoracic pressure and can uh, limit outflow and can increase ICP. Uh, pressure support ventilation doesn't do anything to help with that. Decreased tidal volume to reduce interthoracic pressure doesn't do anything to prevent coughing. And tidal volume is what you need. I mean, whatever tidal volume is that's required is what's required. That's how much air is going into the chest. Uh, the ED receives four clients after motor vehicle collision. Which client should the triage nurse assign first to a resuscitation bay for possible increased ICP? Disorient client with a scalp laceration and BP 140 over 86. Alert teen with an obvious fractured tibia and pain 9 out of 10. Adult with periorbital ecchymosis who reports dizziness. Child who briefly lost consciousness and is now vomiting and irritable. So specifically, we're asking who should be first assigned because of possible increased ICP. So disorientation um, is a, a risk factor, but they have a scalp laceration. So we'll keep them on the list. Um, I'm not seeing a lot that worries me other than the disorientation. B, I don't see any risk factors for increased ICP, so I'm crossing them off. Um, C, periorbital ecchymosis means swelling around the eyes. That's not intracranial. That's just swelling around the eyes and possible dizziness. Maybe they have about this, to me, they have maybe the same risk as A. Child who briefly lost consciousness. So that's, that's traumatic brain injury right there if they lost consciousness. So that's one. And is now vomiting. That's another risk factor. If it said projectile vomiting, I'd be very concerned. Vomiting and irritability. That's a change in level of consciousness. So they actually have three risk factors or three symptoms. Um, a really only has like one or two. C has one or two. D has very clear uh, symptoms or risks, well, symptoms of increased ICP. So we're doing D. All right, that's it. Um, I thought this one was going to take longer than it did, but it didn't. So I talked fast, I guess. So I hope that was helpful to you. Um, to me, increasing or ICP has been challenging in the past because I don't work with it on a regular basis. I don't work with patients with increased ICP, but it's not really all that difficult to um, treat. Uh, in case you didn't get it, just from the questions, nursing care involves mannitol, which is an osmotic diuretic, keeping the head of the bed elevated. Um, certainly seizure precautions would be something we would want to do. Sometimes we give um, Lasix. If we give a loop diuretic, it's going to be Lasix. Um, certainly monitoring the vital signs for Cushing's triad. So these are some things that we can uh, monitor for. Okay. So that's, uh, that's it. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. I hope I had some people ask me to do this ICP. So I hope it met your expectations. Thanks for being a part of the clinic review family.